Hi, I'm Terrell Turner, the host of the Finance and the Accounting Show. And today we have a great topic that we're going to talk about. Now, this is for business owners. If you are looking at doing business globally, there are some considerations that you do need to keep in mind. And you know, you need a resource that is going to help you. And when it comes down to operating globally, the value add tax GSTs, they are a topic that you may not be as familiar with. So you want to make sure that you have a great resource for it. So today's interview is going to be perfect for you. So definitely stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of the Finance and the Accounting Show. This is the place to go for small business owners. If you're looking for a great way to understand the finance and the accounting side of your business, you're in the right place. So stay tuned and enjoy the episode. So without further ado, let me bring in my guest, Alex Wolf. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tyrell. Absolutely pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Now, you know, one of the things that I think is very interesting for a lot of business owners is as they're thinking about, you know, their business and I think 2021 and 2020 really help people, you know, start to leverage more of a wider footprint as far as how to reach customers in different places and so for many businesses that's that's evolved to looking globally now what i'm very interested in talking with you about are you know when it comes down to you know vat or in the us you know we just simply refer to them as sales and use taxes is probably the biggest thing when it comes to that you know what are some of the considerations and i definitely want to hop into that in our conversation but before we do what are you know can you tell us a little bit about your background of how did you find your way into you know this world of, or this aspect of taxation yeah no absolutely so my background is actually at, at university i i didn't really read a, a finance or accounting subject um i was a historian uh, believe it or not um and actually read up on a lot of you know u.s business history um and the kind of history of finance um and then I joined one of the, the big four accounting firms um, and actually from day one um, specialized within indirect tax. So initially UK VAT, uh, the VAT tax um, based out of London, advising British businesses. Um, and then, um, you know, doing my, my training there, learning, learning the craft. Um, I then um, hopped over to, to Grant Thornton um, and then within a year, I actually did a, a secondment to the U.S. And I was based in Chicago for, for a year and a half. And and really, that was a, a really kind of pivotal moment of my career because suddenly I realized, you know, U.S. businesses didn't want to talk about an individual country. Um, you know, yes, they may have operations there. They may have a, a U.K. VAT issue. But the reality is for U.S. business, um, you know, they want to know the whole of the world. You know, if, if 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 you're advising a business on e-commerce, selling digital services, on invoicing, on system changes, it has to be scalable and it has to, um, you know, cover, you know, regions or, or the entire globe. So um, I quickly became a global VAT expert. Um, and, and, and since coming back to the UK, that's been my focus, focusing in on VAT, GST across the globe, traveling, working with. Um, everything from you know international, multinational conglomerates, um, all the way through to you know small businesses, dynamic startups who who are looking to scale very quickly. Nice, nice. You know, one of the things that I'm curious from your perspective um, is you know as you kind of move, you know, looking globally. I mean, kind of started in the UK, then came to Chicago, and you know, were there very start differences in the way that you know these different countries started approaching you know indirect taxation yeah no absolutely so you know the, the us is a bit of an outlier because it's probably the only major economy globally without a vat um so there's probably about 120 countries now across the globe with a vat or gst system um most of those systems are very similar in in terms of the broad model um and the, the big difference between vat and sales tax in the us is vat is a tax on the value added 
And so by definition, VAT is charged at every single stage in the supply chain. There's no general exemption for a resale. Um, exemptions are, are quite thin. Um, and, and that means that um, the rates are higher, um, typically around the 20% mark on average in Europe. They're charged at every, on every single transaction. Um, and because VAT is recoverable by most businesses, there's a very large focus on documentation. So having compliance VAT invoices, um, being able to store those, show them upon an audit. Um, and, and that leads to you know, a lot of changes to processes, to systems, um, and quite a lot of exposure if, if you get it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I would I would definitely agree because I, I remember when I, I took a, a finance leader job and I worked at General Electric and, you know, one of our some of our clients were in Europe. And then when we got to and some of our suppliers were there, too, and we started talking about I started doing business cases and I was like, OK, what is this VAT thing that keeps showing up? Like, what are we paying for? <laughs> This definitely could be a, a eye opener. So as you, you know, you've been, you know, working globally and working with, you know, businesses and, and different partners from, you know, different parts of the world. What has been kind of, you know, some of the hurdles for them to grasp the concept of what VAT is? I mean, because like you said, it doesn't exist in the U.S. So do you see them, you know. Or have there been some helpful things that you've seen them be able to click and actually grasp what that means? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've always liked to compare, um, you know, VAT concepts to concepts um, the U.S. are familiar with, so um, U.S. sales and use tax. So within VAT, it is charged at every single stage, um, which is different from the U.S. But it's it's still the same process. It, it it's calculating the right rate based on um, the taxability of the product, the ship to location, um, the status of the customer, um, and, and, and that involves, you know, having the right master data, the transactional data at your fingertips. Um, so there's a lot of similarities there in terms of a U.S. business setting up their systems, um, you know, for sales tax and then trying to scale that for VAT. Um, you know, in the U.S., there are there are exemptions where sales tax doesn't apply. For VAT, there are, there are similar concepts. Yes, we have exemptions at a at a product level, um, but also somewhere like the EU, when you're selling cross border, if you obtain a VAT number from your customer, that often means you don't need to charge VAT. They can self assess. So, I like to advise U.S. businesses to to see that. Um, process of requesting, validating, retaining that customer VAT number as if they were collecting a, an exemption certificate in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, you know, getting the customer to self-assess for that tax, it's a bit like a use tax in the US. So, you know, again, quite quite similar concepts, um, although different terminology. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, one of the things that is very interesting, I guess, in, in the U.S. that I find in talking to business owners that they struggle with is, you know, when it comes down to sales and use tax, you know, the rates are pretty much kind of controlled at like the, 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 the more the county, the local level to where you can be in one state and there's just a number of different rates that can be applied. When you start to think about, you know, the the EU and we start thinking about globally, you know, are the rates set at kind of a national level, rates set at local level? Like how does that tend to happen? Mm. Yeah, so you know, completely right. In you know, in the US there are probably over ten thousand different taxing jurisdictions. Um, you know, which which means you 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 need zip code data, you know, just to get the right um, you know, rate of tax. Um for VAT, it's generally a federal tax. So VAT GST generally sets um, at a country level. There are a few um, outliers to that. You know, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, I believe, um, you know, may have some some state level taxes um, or different rates um, as part of their VAT system. Actually, Brazil is a another great example there. Um, but I talk when I when you talk about the EU, you have to remember the EU. Um, even though it's, it, it's seen as one market, it's really a collection of 27 
individual member states. So those member states have their own rates. Um, you know, those those range from um, well zero rates exemptions um, all the way up to a top rate of 27% in Hungary. Um, so you know, there are a lot of rates. There are a lot of complexity. Luckily, there are some standard rules as well. So the EU uses something called the VAT directive at an EU level, which has broad rules on um, the rules on when you charge VAT, where you cite as a transaction, um, and, and, and general rules on exemptions. Um, but the real details and the real complexity is at that country level. OK. Gotcha, gotcha. So, and you know, one of the things that you know that comes to mind for a lot of businesses that are operating in the U.S. that that are looking at you know Europe as a, a place to do business, um, as we think about topics like Brexit and you know just the like I said, when you think about the EU, a lot of people just think of it as you know this one consolidation of countries, which is actually like you said, is made up of many countries. But with Brexit happening, you know, were there some significant changes you saw that impacted the way that companies approach, you know, VATs um, with that? Yeah, absolutely. So so Brexit led to, to huge changes in terms of VAT. Um, you know, the relationship between the UK and European member states um, changed. And, you know, initially there was a, a transitional period when everything stayed the same for VAT and customs. Um, you know, so there was a bit of a soft landing. Um, but when that transitional period ended um, in January last year, um, suddenly there was a customs border between the UK and EU. So goods previously could could flow freely um, between the countries, um, you know, just like goods would flow from, you know, Texas to New York. Um, but suddenly there is now a, a customs border. So someone needs to act as an importer. Um, at the border, there is import VAT that could be customs duty based on the value. Um, and then because the UK lost its, its status as, as being an EU member, um, other European countries could put in additional compliance requirements. So making UK businesses a point of fiscal representative, an agent who is jointly liable for VAT in the country. Um, um, as well as not being able to use, you know, certain simplifications for VAT that that some countries may offer other Europeans. Um, so a big change, and you know, we're only starting to see, uh, you know, trade between the UK and the EU start to recover. There was a lot of a big knock of confidence, um, you know, due to the the additional complexity. And then in July last year, we saw um, a huge change within the European Union. Um, the big e-commerce package. So this wasn't a result of Brexit, but it had a huge impact to UK businesses and US businesses. And in fact, any business outside of the EU. And what those changes did was if you were selling um, low value goods um, you know, through e-commerce, um, shipping those goods to consumers within the EU, there was an introduction of something called the import one-stop shop or IOS. And this was a simplified registration. Um, it allows a US, UK, any non-EU business to register uh, with one tax authority. You get a single EU VAT number, um, and then you charge VAT at the point of sale at checkout um, on any goods sold to European consumers um, where the value of the consignment is 150 euros or below. And then the goods um, with your new magic VAT number, go through customs through a, a green channel, quick release through customs, no additional taxes or duty at the border, um, you know, and, and direct to the consumer. So, um, you know, quite a good customer experience. Um, you know, the customer is not waiting for goods stuck at the border. They're not getting demands for, for additional VAT, which, which may have happened in the past. Um, and the latest stats, I think seven and a half thousand businesses have registered for this IOS number. Um, so it really helps fac facilitate sales to the EU. Um, and I'd, I'd advise um, you know any any of your listeners who are selling goods to, to European consumers, um, you know, do look into IOS because it, it's a really good way of unlocking 
um, a European customer base. Nice, nice. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, that definitely comes to mind is, you know, with so many, you know, which is slightly different for the U.S. When you get into, you know, Europe and Asia, I mean, there's so many different countries that, that you're, you know, that your products could be passing through when you start thinking about supply chain, you know, you know what type of implications, because like I said, the, the value add tax is based on every step that adds value. So, you know, when it comes down to the supply chain, you know, what are some of the consider, or are there special considerations that businesses need to keep in mind as they think about whether it's changing their supply chain or whether it's, hey, we want to actually get more products or have the supply chain be more heavily weighted in this country over that country. Yep. <clears throat> Are there major considerations they should be thinking about? Now that, that's a great question, Tyrell. And the, the customs border is often key. So every time um, goods cross a border, there are likely to be implications. Um, so if a US business is selling into Europe or in fact, you know, any country around the world, um, and they can arrange for their customer to be the importer, you know, that generally shifts any VAT obligations back to the customer. Um, but the moment you start looking at things like DDP delivery terms, INCO terms, um, you know, where you're, you are contractually obligated to be the importer and, um, you know, pay any customs duties at the border, that is likely to then trigger a VAT requirement in that country. Um, you know, if you're moving inventory around borders, again, that's likely to trigger um, more registrations that you're required. Um, and if you procure um, goods, finished goods, um, raw materials, components in one country, and then drop ship those to customers in that country or another, again, you're opening yourself up to you know, multiple VAT registrations. I think the key here is getting visibility, you know, understanding where you're procuring goods from, understanding um, the INCO terms, what's agreed with the customer, what's agreed with your vendor. Um, and then, you know, once you have that data, it's, it's then identifying, you know, where you need to register. Um, at Avalara, you know, we, we assist businesses across that whole life cycle. Um, everything from, you know, providing insights into um, changing global legislation um, all the way through to registering a business um, for VAT. Uh, we, we currently register businesses in over 60 different countries, can help prepare returns, um, help calculate the right tax, um, you know, on the transaction, um, help remit that, um, as well as providing the technology so businesses can, can, can take that in-house. Um, but still automate that, you know, that tax compliance. Gotcha. So if I'm hearing all of this correctly, and I'm going to try to summarize and set the stage for the business owner or any business environment where to really, you know, take your business to the next level, a global strategy could be the, the, the right play for that business. But when you're looking at a global strategy, you know, you have, you know, multiple countries and each country has some autonomy to how they establish their VAT. And within that, there are multiple, you know, import, export kind of customs trigger points. And there are, you know, some, some, some differences in the rules and you're the CFO, you're the CEO, and you're thinking, Hey, we're going to make this strategy change, or we're going to change our supply chain. Now you have to manage all that. So, which brings us to the point of with Avalar. So, how do people, you know, really get in touch with Avalar to find out, like, hey, I got this massive scenario of things that I need to figure out that I'm not a specialist in. So, how do people usually work with Avalar to, to start getting help to solve that massive problem that they're facing? Yeah. So, Avalara.com. Um, our website is, is a really great start. Um, and there is a wealth of knowledge there um, in terms of blogs, um, in, in terms of you know background to different countries and different states in the US, um, you know, what are the rules and thresholds? 
um, but also a really good overview of, of the different solutions and, and, and products that we offer. Um, and then, you know, once you've reached out and, and made contact with us, um, you know, a member of the team will um, understand the business, understand the supply chain, the trade flows, um, you know, where where you're doing business, um, you know, and, and we've, we've got that experience of identifying where are the pain points, where is that likely going to trigger a requirement to register for VAT, GST or sales tax. Um, the, the rules can be very complex um, and, and, you know, they're, they're changing almost daily. You know, one of my roles with the company is to track changing global legislation, analyze it, look at the impact it has on our customers, on our products, on our content. Um, it really is changing daily. But um, the, the way I see it is that rule change or, a, you know, a, a new return or regime, it may be new in that country, but it's certainly not new globally. And we've seen it before. Um, and, and the advice I would give, uh, you know, CFO is you want a, you want a single scalable global process to the extent you can. Um, of course, there's going to be details. There's going to be differences in individual countries. Um, but you want to aim for a, a single scalable process. And that's going to be everything from, um, you know, your invoices, um, you know, the, the software you invest in to calculate tax. Um, and, and your internal processes and controls. Nice, nice. Now, do you find that um, companies reach out to Avalar as they're kind of in that business case kind of stage of, hey, we're thinking about making these changes, but we don't know who to ask to actually get the insight because, I mean, the, the VATs and the processes and the, the, the steps that it means for for what you need to add to your system or tweak to your system could change the outcome that they choose. So do you find that many companies reach out to Avalar when they're kind of in that strategy and strategic thinking stage um, before they pull the trigger on the decision? Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of, uh, you know, prospective customers come to us because they want to understand what's the art of the possible. Um, you know, they, they tell us their, their objectives, what are they trying to achieve? Um, you know, some of that may be from a, a commercial and efficiency, financial savings point of view, um, all the way through to, um, you know, we want to enter new markets. We want to go into Europe for the first time. Um, you know, do, do you guys have um, a solution for India or, or Brazil? Um, which we do. Um, but, you know, they, those are the kind of questions. Um, and you know our, our our team will you know as I said you know work through those objectives you know find the right fit in terms of the solutions um, you know we we provide and um, you know offer some insights um, you know we've we've got over thirty thousand customers across the globe so um, a lot of those pain points a lot of those objectives um, you know we've seen and heard that before. Awesome, I, I think that is great. I would say. Having been a person who's, you know, worked in as a finance leader in, involving, you know, importing, exporting products between different countries and even myself having worked in Brazil for some time, I will say it will go a long way of getting help from someone who understands it. <laughs> also, Absolutely. I mean, Brazil is um, the most complex indirect tax system <laughs> in the world. Um, you know, probably even more complex than the US. I mean, they have a very similar state, municipal, federal um, kind of three tier approach to indirect tax. Um, but, you know, luck luckily, you know, we've got a great team there that, uh, you know, know, know all the detail and I, I reach out to myself. Awesome. I, I, I love that. I just remember when I worked in Brazil for manufacturing um, company and I remember there were days where I would spend four hours sitting with the tax person trying to help me understand why this was going to impact or how this was going to impact the business. And after four hours, like we've only scratched the surface. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we wrap up, you know, one question that I always love asking um, is, you know, when you think about, you know, all of the, all of the different topics, all the different aspects of, the different things you touch and, and how you're able to 
helped so many different companies kind of think through whether it's the strategic stage or whether it's, hey, they've already implemented. Now they need to stand up a process that's going to be scalable and sustainable. Um, what's two things that you would call the business leaders attention to or two tips that you would call their attention to? And it can be something you've already said that you want to reiterate or <coughs> two new things. OK, absolutely. Um, I suppose that the, the first thing I would say, and you know, reinforcing something I've already said, is <clears throat> think global, think scalable. Um, in my experience, it's too easy for a, for a business to try and think about a local solution and just get a tactical response. Um, you know, that solution may not be scalable. Um, it may be a short term solution. Um, it, it may be a kind of sticky plaster approach. Um, but, you know, the, the world is, is getting a much smaller place when it comes to commerce at the moment. And a new customer, a new market is only a click away. So, you know, I would think from day one, whether you're implementing a new system, um, you know, you're selecting um, a tax calculation engine, um, you know, all the way through to your, your selecting your, your billing platform, you're, you're creating your um, invoice template. Think global, think scalable. Think um, not only about the markets you're in today, um, but where you're going to be in, um, you know, tomorrow, next year. The, the second one, um, <clears throat> I would just say, be very aware of the future direction of travel of tax compliance. Um, because there is, we are going to see a huge shift away from the summary tax return. Um, you know, so at the moment, um, you prepare a summary BAT return or sales tax return. Um, you know, declaring the tax. Um, the, the tax authority see a summary total. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's a few granular boxes on a return. Um, but the future, and we're seeing this now across the globe. Um, it's a huge trend in Europe at the moment is the move to real-time digital reporting. Um, and that doesn't only just affect um, submitting data periodically to a tax authority um, through things like a standard audit file or ledger files. Um, we're actually seeing the tax authority obtain transactional data in real time the same day. So a great example of that is in, in Italy. Um, every invoice issued by a supplier goes via a government portal. The Italian tax authority know the tax that's been charged on that invoice before the customers even receive that invoice. <laughs> um, you know, there are there are several European countries who are introducing this over the next couple of years, um, including um, Spain, France, Germany, the you know, three huge economies will be doing that in the next few years too. So that is a trend and I, you know, I would I would start um, you know, looking into that, you know, does the business have a strategy, particularly if you have a footprint out of the US? Um, how are you going to deal, um, you know, with, with the data you need um, and changes to business process, things like e-invoicing? Awesome. Well, Alex, thank you so much for being a awesome guest on the show. Um, really bring to light, you know, all of the complexities that are there. And so I, I strongly urge you know, all of the listeners and the viewers to go over to avalar.com, check out a lot of the resources that they have there, because as you start to scale your business, these are all very real considerations that you need to prepare yourself for if you're going to make the most of that transition. So Alex, thank you for being an amazing guest on the show. Tyrell, thank you ever so much. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Finance and Accounting Show. If you like what you heard, don't be selfish. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and then share this with a friend because you know a business owner that could definitely use this insight. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, share it with a friend, and turn on the notification bell so you get all the updates when we release a new episode.